Chapter One of Twenty Minutes Late. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. Chapter One Disappointment. The autumn day was as beautiful as scarlet and crimson and gold maple leaves could make it. The air was a charming crisp. The world looked lovely, and did its best to make Caroline Bryant own it. But that young woman's heart was sore and sad. She tried her best to be cheerful, and succeeded so well that her little sister Daisy confided to the dolls that, Sister Line took disappointments in a lovely way. Caroline did laugh a little when she heard this, but in a somewhat scornful way it struck her as absurd that anybody should call her trouble disappointment because she told herself philosophically i do not suppose one can properly use that word when there has never been the slightest hope of having one's wish and i am sure i have never for five seconds believed that i could go away it was out of the question of course despite which statement and following the smile so suddenly that it must almost have startled it a great tear plashed down into the dishwater say what she might about never having an idea of it the fact remained that when the letter was written and sealed and dropped into the post office which said a very grateful no to the invitation an added lump of pain seemed to rise up in the girl's throat the invitation had been from judge dunmore himself heartily seconded by his wife to spend two beautiful weeks in their city home and attend the exposition where so many wonderful things were to be seen that the judge said it was really quite an education for a young person with wide open eyes the letter had further added that they would be glad to include both ben and daisy in the invitation only they were well aware that the little daisy would be considered too young to make a visit apart from her mother and that ben the caretaker would be needed to look after mother and sister so that miss caroline was the only person whom they could in honesty be said to expect it would be difficult to describe the state of excitement into which this letter threw caroline bryant she remembered taking a journey with her mother on the cars when she was nine years old a journey of seven hours duration and the marvellous experiences of that day she sometimes went over even now for daisy's benefit it was her one journey and she had all an intelligent girl's longing for travel and the experiences to be gained by travel the very toot toot of the engine as it halted for a few seconds at the depot around the corner and then hurried on with increased speed apparently sorry for having lost so much time made her cheek flush and her heart beat faster what joy it would have been to have taken a journey all by herself quite a long journey too nearly a hundred miles to be sure a grey-headed lawyer whom judge dunmore knew would be on the same car with her and see that she stopped at the right station just as though she would not know enough for that she said to the dishes with a toss of the head but then what was the use in talking about that she couldn't do it it was quite impossible of course to think of going notwithstanding the fact that judge dunmore had enclosed a pass for her over the road there was something very delightful to her in the thought of travelling on a pass only people of distinction have them she said to daisy and she could not help laughing over the little girl's question then line what right would you have to use one i mean she said when caroline laughed that although you are dear and precious and are more to us than any one else in the world of course you are not what they mean by a person of distinction are you not yet her sister had answered gaily but you wait little daisy nobody knows what i may do for the honor of the family some day the present beauty of it though is that judge dunmore is a person of distinction and he has sent a little shadow of it to rest upon me what a wonderful thing it would be to visit at his house 
oh daisy if i could only go of course i cannot think of going she had said to her mother with a wild hope in her heart that her mother would say of course you must go dear such an opportunity is not to be missed but instead the dear mother had smiled upon her wistfully tenderly and shaken her head it is not to be thought of dear you know how much mother wishes you could have such a chance but your wardrobe which is quite respectable for home wear would not do to visit in a house like judge dunmore's if there were no other reason that would be sufficient why i have my dark blue dress caroline said wistfully and you said you were going to make that brown skirt over for me and my gray flannel looks pretty well mrs bryant smiled and hid a sigh and still shook her head the gray flannel is too short in both skirt and waist line dear she said and has very thin places in it beside it will do at home for a while but could not be depended upon for a day away from home and the brown one will not make over into anything but a second best nor will it bear much wear so you can see it narrows itself down to a dark blue dress which has already been worn one winter it seems hard daughter but there are worse ills in the world and there is the school you remember to look forward to after new years you must feed your heart upon that and let the exposition wait another year for at last after two years of waiting caroline bryant was going back to school she had expected to enter the fall term but a slight illness of her mother had alarmed them all and almost made the daughter determine that she would never leave her to toil alone even for school however mrs bryant had rallied rapidly and had at last assured her children that she really felt better than she had for a long time before she was sick so though it was too late for the fall term plans for the one to open the day after new year's went forward joyfully life had looked bright to caroline until this letter from judge dunmore had set her pulses to throbbing wildly her neighbor and friend fanny kedwin had not helped her much such luck she said enviously as they discussed the invitation for the dozenth time if i could get invited to a place like that you may believe i would go if i had to sell my old shoes to get the things i needed i certainly should too answered line bursting into the first laugh that she had given in several hours at the absurdity of the suggestion the only trouble is that my old shoes wouldn't furnish the money and yours must look better than they did yesterday if they would now fanny kedwin was the sort of girl who could never endure to be laughed at though there was the utmost good nature in the laugh she answered with sharpness well i don't care my mother says if her girl had such a chance to see the world she would work her fingers to the bone but that she should go she says she should think you earned enough to have a little pleasure especially when it is fixed so that it will not cost you anything poor caroline was paying dearly for her laugh her cheeks glowed and she held her head high and spoke stiffly i ought to be much obliged to your mother for the interest she takes in me i think but i can assure you that the last thing i want is to have my mother work her fingers to the bone to give me a chance to go away from home for a few days i do not have so hard a time at home as that would suggest and i may as well tell you in plain words fanny kedwin that my mother and i understand each other and do not need any help from other people she was very angry in fact had been growing more angry every moment since she commenced her reply fanny kedwin gazed at her in surprise truth to tell caroline was not usually so quick to take offence as this and often bore plain talk with good nature from this girl not so well brought up as herself the unusual exhibition seemed to fill her with curiosity instead of anger i declare i believe it is true she said with an air of conviction and not waiting for caroline to decide whether she should lower her dignity to ask what was true proceeded to explain 
the girls in school said to-day that ben was a great deal better than he used to be that he didn't get mad half so quick and that he was unselfish too well he was always unselfish but they said he kept getting more so all the time and that you were getting worse lucy ellis said you were getting to be a regular spitfire that you as good as told her to mind her own business last night when she asked an innocent question caroline had no reply to make this time she was already ashamed of her outburst and that even if she had not been conscious that as far as lucy ellis was concerned the verdict was true would have held her silent she remembered the question well it had been about this same visit say line lucy had said why do you suppose they invited you it seems kind of queer you know when they haven't any girls of your age to visit with don't you suppose maybe they have a lot of company and want you for a kind of extra help then had caroline's face flushed in a way that would have grieved her mother and perhaps it was little wonder she as good as told lucy it was none of her business why she was invited all things considered the invitation had certainly been productive of a good deal of unhappiness to caroline she tried to think about it seriously after fanny kedwin went home was she growing worse daily as they said she knew she was not so good as ben never had been indeed it was not likely she ever would be ben was different in every way from most boys miss webster said he was a rare boy so did mr holden but she did not want to grow worse every day why did that old invitation ever come when it couldn't do anything for her but make her cross caroline finished the day as indeed she had begun it in a burst of tears it was because of this disappointment of caroline's that a day of pleasure was planned for saturday it is true that it had been talked of for a long time but benjamin bryant had not really roused himself to action until it became certain that his sister was not to go on the journey this same benjamin deserves a few words on his own account a clear-eyed pure-hearted manly-looking boy was ben a general favorite at home and on the street fanny kedwin had correctly reported his classmates idea of his character indeed she might have said much more for ben was often the subject of conversation especially among the younger scholars there is not a selfish hair on his head was a favorite sentence often heard as though selfishness had had its favorite seat in the hair nor a lazy one some good-natured boy was always sure to add i never saw ben bryant's beat for being always at work and i never saw anything like his luck this last contribution to his character was offered by rufus kedwin who was always talking about luck why he earns lots of money you've seen that little piping machine of his haven't you which looks like a doll's plaything or something of that sort well sir ben makes it spin i tell you and the money he earns in a month with the thing would scare you he gets copying to do you know and all sorts of jobs i just wish i had one of those machines and you'd see me make it go i thought ben offered to let you learn on his said one of the older boys with a significant smile so he did last winter but now he is so busy with it there is never time to learn it and when he isn't using it line is she can run it as fast as he can well for that matter so can daisy did you learn asked the older boy thus pressed rufus answered that he did not that he didn't see any use in learning a thing which couldn't be used after it was learned if i only had a machine he repeated it would be different the boys within hearing laughed they were always amused when rufus kedwin got off that if i only had it was a term so constantly on his lips there seemed no end to his wants nor the wonders he could do if they were once supplied what is the thing anyhow one of the new boys asked and was informed that it was a writing machine and could go like lightning and do beautiful work 
ben is one of your goody goody boys isn't he said this newcomer depends on what you mean by that answered howard benham if that means downright good without any sham and every time why it describes ben as well as any boy i know well i meant he is one of the religious kind goes to prayer meeting and sunday school and that sort of thing doesn't he i believe he does and he doesn't go bird nesting on sunday nor get a demerit for it on monday nor anything of that sort the sneering tone in which the new scholar had spoken had been too much for ben's champion who could not therefore resist the temptation to turn the laugh upon him he having recently gone through the experience hinted at i am telling you these things in passing only to show you in what light ben was regarded by some of his schoolmates we were going to talk about the day of pleasure ben set himself at working it up but not until he had talked with his mother about the matter End of chapter one chapter two of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two clothes is it entirely out of the question for line to go mother entirely i should say mrs bryant answered with a tone that had more sadness in it than the boy realized she was a mother who would have so enjoyed giving her children all they desired if she only could well now i don't see why ben began there's the fare paid for and it is just in the time when you are not hurried with work and long before the next term of school what is it that is in the way clothes my son clothes repeated ben stopping in his work of skilfully laying the fire for morning to give his mother an astonished look why mother she wears clothes at home true but there are clothes and clothes my dear boy but line always looks nice i was looking at her last night at the lecture and i made up my mind she was the prettiest girl there his mother smiled fondly upon him i am glad you are pleased with your sister's appearance she said she is a pretty girl and is always neat but my boy what would be suitable in our quiet home would be entirely out of place at judge dunmore's and your sister is one to feel such things if it were your duty to go there with your best jacket a little worn and your pantaloons a little shorter than you like them and your neckties old-fashioned i should know that you could forget about them all if you made up your mind to do so and have a pleasant time in spite of them but caroline is not like you in this respect she would be miserable i fear she wants so much to go that she thinks she would not mind these things but i know her better than that she has never been away from home and does not realize the contrast there would be between her and other girls of her age you need not wish her to go ben under present circumstances for i know as well as though i saw her undergoing it that she would be miserable ben looked disappointed and troubled i don't see what she is to do then he said she will be hindered from many places where she might have opportunities if she is to go on nursing such a spirit that is true and if she were able to rise above the question of dress so as to be happy in a neat blue calico when the dresses of all about her were silks and cashmeres i should be glad but i assure you she could not be happy so placed but mother i don't quite understand you if you don't think it right that line should put the question of dress so high why do you encourage her in it i mean why don't you advise her to go and see for herself what nice times she could have in calico if that is the name of the stuff which ought not to be worn what is the matter with it anyhow that is a hard question to answer his mother said smiling nothing is the matter with it i suppose except that it is not worn by people of means i do not wonder that you are puzzled she added as she watched his disturbed face it is a question that has perplexed wiser heads than yours or mine this one of dress and what to do about it i was quite enthusiastic over it once 
and tried to get up a society among the schoolgirls, get the wealthy ones to join, pledging themselves to wear nothing but calico for a term of years, so that the people who were obliged to dress in calico would feel comfortable wherever they went. Ben's face brightened. I think that was a splendid idea, he said eagerly. Did you do it? And if you did, why did it not last? It never began, his mother said, laughing. I had a wise mother at home who pricked my bubble for me, and showed me that it was not filled with material which would last. I don't see why, said Ben, disconcerted. Think, my boy, suppose Miss Sutherland and Miss Webster and Mrs. Judge Dunmore, and any other wealthy people whom we knew, as well as many whom we do not know, could be induced to take such a pledge, and should appear from this time dressed in calico. How long would it be before the price of calico, or gingham for that matter, or any stuff which they would make fashionable in that way, would increase in price so that the hardest thing we poor people could do would be to buy it? That is true, said Ben, thoughtfully and somewhat sorrowfully, not so much over the dress question as over the thought that there is much to be learned in the world, and he was not making as rapid progress as he could wish. The truth is, Ben Bryant was doing well, and was not far behind the boys who had been to school steadily during his year of outside work, but he did not know it. After this, he gave up the idea of the visit, and planned for the day of pleasure. It was to be a nutting expedition, away out at the Beekman Grove. It was true there were nuts nearer home, but none so nice. At least, that was the opinion of the Kedwins, who were sure that if they could not go to just that spot, they did not care to go at all. "'It's too long a walk for Daisy,' said Mrs. Bryant, but Daisy was earnest in her protest. "'Why, mother, I am very strong. I could walk six miles, I am sure.' Rufus explained earnestly that on the return trip they would need only to walk to the station, half a mile from where they went into the woods, and there they could get the express due at half-past five, just the time they would want to go home. Oh, no, indeed, he and Fanny would not think of going if they must walk both ways. But to ride on the cars costs money, Ben said at last, after looking at Line, who did nothing but look at him. Ben thought there were reasons why this remark would sound better coming from her. Oh, money, said Rufus, as loftily as though he were a millionaire. Why, it costs only ten cents apiece. If we can't afford that much for a three-mile ride, almost four miles, we must be hard up. I've walked three miles more than once to save ten cents, said Ben with a cheerful laugh. On a pleasant day, when you have plenty of time, it is as nice a way of saving money as I know. However, this is an especial occasion." and again he looked at Caroline. Mrs. Bryant came to the rescue. She was interested in this holiday. Yes, she said briskly, it's a very special occasion. My young people do not often spend money for pleasure. I fully agree with Ben that ten cent pieces are worth saving. In fact, those who do not save them will never, as a rule, have much else to save. But then, sometimes they have to be spent. I vote for this as one of the times. I suppose the nuts are nicer in the Beekman woods than anywhere else. They used to be when I was a girl. And it is too far to walk both ways. I don't know about Daisy, but the others could manage one way nicely, and have a pleasant time doing it, I should say, and I'll put you up a nice lunch. Ben knew about Daisy if his mother did not. He resolved that she should go if he could compass the matter. He came one morning in high glee, and drew a faint squeal from Daisy in his effort to seat her upon his head before he explained, "'Daisy, Linda, I have fixed it. Mr. Brownlow's wagon is going out to his farm on Saturday after a load, going out empty, and I know a little woman who can ride almost to the trees where the nuts grow, sitting upon a beautiful cushion of hay.' "'The wood wagon,' echoed Caroline in a dismayed voice, 
girls of my age do not go out riding in a great clumsy wagon of that kind ben looked at his mother who smiled but said not a word i was speaking of a girl of daisy's age he said rather dryly i didn't speak for a chance to ride for any one but her though miss webster said she should think we would all like to ride in a wood wagon she said when she was a girl nothing pleased her more than a ride out to the farm on the hay rack oh well said caroline the hay rack is a very different thing i have read stories about girls riding on loads of hay but never of climbing into a great lumber wagon like that on which they carry wood then i suppose if i ever need to have you take a ride on such an affair i shall have to hire some one to write a story about it first said ben again half in fun and half in vexation his sister caroline's lately acquired ideas in regard to being a young lady were somewhat trying and rather puzzling to him saturday came as bright as an autumn day could be and just cold enough for enjoyment the walking party started on ahead mrs bryant herself tucked daisy into the great wagon and gave jack the gray-haired driver a good old man and a warm friend of daisy's many directions touching her comfort the ride was one long delight to the little girl she was surprised and half sorry when they came to a turn in the road and saw the walking party comfortably seated on a rail fence waiting for them how could you have got here so quick asked daisy quick said jack shaking his sides with quiet laughter why we've come powerful slow it's uphill all the way and the horses worked hard yesterday and will have a tremendous load to bring back so i let em take it easy besides you entertained the old man so well he forgot to drive he lifted her out as if she had been a rare bit of china which might get broken if he were not very careful and drove slowly on looking back with a half regretful air at her as he said she's one of the lord's little white lilies and no mistake then to comfort himself old jack fell to singing in a loud strong voice the lord into his garden comes the spices yield a rich perfume the lilies grow and thrive End of chapter 2chapter three of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three something to remember what a day that was for the woods what a delicious piney nutty smell there was to the air caroline bryant stood just at the edge of the woodlot and looked over on the distant hills on the tall trees in their autumn dress of many colors up to the blue sky took long draughts of air into her lungs and said oh how beautiful everything is i wish we could come oftener i wish mother was here let us come next week ben and get mother to come along how she would like this view of the hills but they didn't come next week it was a day to remember for many reasons long afterwards the sights and sounds and smells belonging to the woods gave to both caroline and ben bryant peculiar sensations one episode to remember happened about the middle of the afternoon the nutting party had worked industriously for several hours had roved through the woods gathering other treasures than nuts had found a sunny slope where only trees enough stood to make it pleasant for a camping ground that bright day and had spread out their dinner of bread and butter cold meat rice pudding with raisins in it and a cake which fanny kedwin had assured them was really pound cake made by her mother for this occasion never lunch tasted better than did this when daisy rummaging in the basket brought out a lovely little tart apiece mrs bryant's surprise for them their satisfaction reached its climax it was after they had all agreed that it would not be possible to take home any more nuts than were gathered that they resolved on following the merry little brook which gurgled through the edge of the woods a little further up the stream 
to see if they could find any late berries they were rewarded not by berries but by the growing beauty of the stream and the wood and mosses and lichens which were more to both caroline and daisy than berries would have been fanny did not share their tastes she admitted that she saw no beauty in the rough-looking lichen and said that the moss had ugly gray streaks through it but the bryant basket was filled with some that had the most streaks of any to the exquisite joy of daisy meantime rufus found a new enjoyment in sailing small boats made of the largest leaves from the trees and seeing them rush down the stream only to make shipwreck on the gnarled trunk of an old tree which lay in the bend of the stream a few rods below come down here he called to the girls and see my boat it is nice here the brook has grown into a river i can't go down any more hills said caroline i believe i am tired and she threw herself upon the bank i am tired too fanny said dropping beside her and i don't want to see any old boat either rufus is just wild over the water if it were the ocean there would be some sense in it but a little brook i am tired of don't go down there daisy called out caroline as the little girl was taking careful steps down the hill in answer to rufus's call she stopped at caroline's word but looked wistfully down on the bright stream that had become almost a river she was fond of water i would not go dear i am too tired to go another step and it looks there as though the water was deep nonsense said rufus who had come halfway up the bank to see why his call was not answered and heard the words if you and fanny are too lazy to come that is no reason why daisy should not see the fish they are darting about there like anything i have a line and hook in my pocket and i should not wonder if she could catch one let her come line i'll take care of her where's ben he went to cut some canes for us to walk home with do you want very much to go daisy well rufus you keep watch of her won't you she isn't used to water you know course said rufus indifferently there is no danger not the least in the world she couldn't drown herself if she should try i should not like to have her try said caroline with a shiver she would get a wetting at least and take cold then they went down the hill together caroline changed her position to get a view of the little girl established on the bank with a fish line standing very still with a look of intense interest on her face if she should catch a fish what an event it would be there really seemed to be no danger whatever as rufus had said and caroline allowed her mind to wander away from her little sister and only half listened to a long story fanny was telling because her thoughts went forward to that city home which she so longed to visit and for the hundredth time she began to picture to herself the delights that would have been hers if she had gone suddenly a faint little scream made her turn quickly in that direction rufus was nowhere to be seen and the brown head of the little fisher was trying to struggle up from the water with a few great bounds caroline bryant was at the foot of the hill followed by the frightened fanny for mercy's sake what has happened she called then taking in the situation she added her cry to the excitement rufus oh rufus where are you daisy is drowning it really seemed as though she were rufus had been mistaken when he said she could not drown if she tried nothing would have been easier for a frightened little girl who could not stand on the slippery stones caroline waited for no rufus gave no thought to herself nor indeed to what was best to be done but made a spring into the swift flowing water and grasped for her sister's dress but the stream was deep at that point and the current swift and caroline unused to the water the utmost she could do was to grasp the branch of a fallen tree which hung low over the brook and hold to it with one hand while she held daisy firmly under the other arm as for fanny kedwin her screams did good service 
rufus appeared at last from behind a tree further down the road but not before ben bryant had come with great bounds throwing off his jacket as he ran and by the time rufus pale and ashamed had reached the water's edge ben had daisy in his arms and was calling out give line your hand quick i don't want his hand said caroline marching proudly out of the stream and up the hill the water dripping from her clothes where is daisy give her to me oh ben is she hurt not a bit said ben cheerfully though his usually ruddy cheeks were pale and he held his limp little sister in a very close embrace having already seized his coat and wrapped it around her she will be all right as soon as she can have something dry on how shall we manage it line give her to me said caroline holding out her arms gather some sticks and start a fire as soon as you can i must get her clothes off and dry them what can i wrap her in while they are drying if my clothes were not wet here said rufus stripping off his jacket in haste put this around her it will help some oh line i am so sorry i didn't think there was the least danger of her tumbling in i had just gone a little way up the road to hunt a squirrel i saw go by i can't imagine how it happened the fish-pole slipped into the water explained the quivering lips of daisy and i tried to get it and then i slipped caroline's first impulse had been to haughtily refuse the jacket but a glance at rufus's troubled face together with a warning look from ben saved her from this bit of rudeness besides the jacket was a thick one and added quite a little to daisy's comfort in a very short space of time a fire was burning brightly and a fireplace of stones hastily set up a sheltered spot having been found both boys worked with a will what shall we do for a match ben asked pausing in dismay just as the fire was ready to be lighted i have one said rufus producing a tin box filled with those useful articles ben bent over with a grave face he was glad to have the match but the fact that rufus had them in his pocket made him think of the news he had heard but the day before that rufus was learning to smoke work went forward rapidly now fanny kedwin not to be behind the others in her quick-witted helpfulness went behind the branches of a gnarled tree and slipped off a bright red flannel petticoat which she proposed should enwrap the little drowned maiden while her clothes were being dried this with the addition of rufus's jacket which was not so large nor so wet as ben's soon made for her a picturesque costume her own garments meanwhile were hung upon sticks hastily cut and driven into the ground about the fire it was really a pretty sight when all was done and the spirits of the boys rose rapidly even fanny declared that since no one was hurt it was great fun but daisy was very quiet the chill of the water was too recent upon her shrinking flesh and her terror had been too real to rally so rapidly she found opportunity for a word in private with caroline who would not allow her out of her sight line dear i want to ask you something before you came down to the water i thought nobody saw me and i thought i should drown and i did not want to i felt afraid of course you did not want to drown darling said line giving her some vigorous kisses and hugging her closer line was a naughty sister to let you go down there with that heedless boy i will never trust you with him again if he lives to be a hundred oh line he didn't mean to do any harm he thought i knew enough to stand still on the bank but i did not think i would be afraid to drown don't said caroline almost sharply shivering as though a north wind had struck her i cannot bear to hear you talk about it of course you would be afraid to drown it's not natural for little girls to feel any other way but little girls die said daisy thoughtfully you shall not declared caroline with another embrace that was almost fierce 
daisy gave over any further attempt to get any knowledge on this subject from caroline and decided it was not wise to talk to her about such things a little later in the day when the brisk fire and brisk wind had done their duty with the wet clothes and daisy was arrayed in her own garments once more they would be as good as new if they had only been ironed line told her daisy sought a convenient moment to slip her hand into ben's and draw him aside to say ben i want to ask you something and i don't want the others to hear because they do not seem to understand when i was down there in the water and no one came for just a little minute it seemed longer than that you know i thought you could not hear me and would never come and i should drown to death i was afraid and did not want to line says of course not that little girls always feel so but little girls die i do not want to be afraid to die i did not think i would be ben why do you think jesus let me feel so ben's nerves were stronger than caroline's he controlled the inward shudder and only pressed the small dear hand closer as he said after a thoughtful moment little daisy i do not understand these things very well i have had no chance to study them and i may teach you wrong but i will tell you how it seems to me you did not drown you know oh no said daisy gratefully line came very quick and so did you but i thought i was going to but jesus knew you were not going to daisy and that is the reason he did not come to whisper to you not to be afraid that he was going to take you home to heaven if the time had come for you to go i do not think you would have been afraid do you understand what i mean a radiant smile broke over the grave little face oh yes i do she said eagerly you mean he did not make me want to die because he did not mean to let me die yet and it was so i would not be disappointed when you brought me back you know he is very thoughtful of little girls yes said ben then bent down and kissed the fair face which was paler than usual this afternoon and thought how easily she took up his half-expressed notion and made it clear for him and thought also that he was very good to the brothers of little girls for how could they have lived without daisy end of chapter three chapter four of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a pretty state of things but berries and squirrels and bright leaves had some way lost their charm for the entire party let us go away as soon as we can rufus said i don't believe i ever want to come to these woods again i shouldn't think you would said caroline significantly she could not help this one reference to his unfaithfulness however once away from that particular spot rufus proved to be not so much in a hurry he roved off after a squirrel or a bird or sometimes only a queer-looking flying bug also he climbed a tree in search of a deserted bird's nest and dashed into a thicket after a peculiar kind of walking stick getting himself entangled in such a way that ben had to go to his rescue and it was a work of time to release his jacket without leaving a piece of it on the thorn bush do come on said caroline at last losing patience entirely we shall be late for the train and i'm sure i cannot walk home to-night if i never reach there are you very tired ben asked looking anxiously at her the truth was he was not accustomed to hearing his sister speak in that manner my head aches a little she said evasively this was a mild statement of the truth as a matter of fact her head ached so badly it seemed to her she could not get home the fright about daisy and the anxiety afterward lest the frail little girl should take cold had reacted upon her in this manner and as she was unused to headache it was all the harder to bear this last has been too much for you said ben then raising his voice he spoke with authority 
come rufus you must not hinder us any longer if we miss that train i don't know how line will get home she certainly cannot walk miss the train said rufus in contempt more likely we shall have to sit in that old shed at the junction and wait for half an hour it isn't near train time look at the sun i should think it would be a great deal better to take it slowly and use up the time on the road nevertheless he left off chasing the last squirrel and walked quietly along toward the junction but squirrels and other creatures had taken more time than they had planned arrived at the junction ben went at once to make inquiries and returned with a disturbed face here is a pretty state of things he said that train has been gone twenty minutes gone echoed rufus what does that mean they have changed their time no they haven't changed their time we have wasted our time over squirrels and things said ben in a greater state of vexation than he often allowed himself to exhibit caroline as soon as she heard the news had dropped in a dismayed heap on the ground as if to say that to take another step was out of the question what is to be done i should like to know said ben it will not be possible for these girls to walk home they won't have to walk answered rufus in a vexed tone nor we either there's no need of being so cross about it all we have to do is to wait half an hour or so for the freight it takes on an accommodation car here that folks can ride on there it stands now and all that we have to do is to sit here and wait until the train comes why we need not do that we can go right into the car and seat ourselves it will be a comfortable place to wait in when is the train due asked caroline oh about six o'clock or so oh dear mother will be so frightened murmured caroline wouldn't it be better to walk walk echoed rufus in disdain you just said you couldn't take another step and i'm sure i'm tired enough to drop you don't catch me walking home tonight if i wait till midnight for a train six o'clock isn't late i'm sure you ought not to walk said ben anxiously but i might and let mother know what has happened only of course i should not get there much before the train will of course you wouldn't rufus said promptly not as soon as the train i dare say how long does it take a steam car to run three miles just then a horse came dashing down the road drawing a single carriage with a lady and gentleman in whoa said mr holden sharply to the horse why here is a troop of our friends have you missed the train that is bad what is to be done ben explained while the lady called caroline to her side and heard part of the story we might take daisy between us said mr holden in reply to ben's anxiety about her we have room for a small mouse of that size have we not alice oh yes indeed his sister said she could ride between them as well as not and they were going directly home now all their calls were made then daisy can report for your house and we will call at mrs kedwin's to let her know that her young people are all right so daisy was cuddled into the carriage the gay robe tucked carefully about her caroline explaining anxiously meanwhile to the lady what a narrow escape the child had had and how much afraid they were of her taking cold she will be as warm as a kitten behind the stove said miss alice kissing her charge and snugging her closer i shall keep her carefully covered and we shall be home before it is much colder then they drove away and caroline drew a long sigh of relief i'm so glad that daisy does not have to wait in the cold till after six o'clock she said mother will know what to do to keep her from taking cold for some reason rufus did not like to hear any reference to the accident and he muttered that they ought not to have taken such a little molly coddle as that on a day's tramp the tramp was all right said ben but the wedding was pretty hard on a little girl we know you meant no harm rufus but the trouble we have had was not daisy's fault 
when ben spoke in that tone rufus always wished he had kept still oh well there was no harm done he said crossly i don't think you need to keep harping on it all the while come on fanny let us get into the car but just then came a pair of fine horses prancing down the road hold on said rufus let us first see who it is in this carriage what a splendid carriage it is only look at those horses that old nag mr holden drives is only a bundle of bones beside them that's mr staunton he's a great railroad man you know as he spoke the carriage drew up in front of the station briggs said a gentleman putting his head out of the carriage and speaking to one of the railroad men in front of the switch have you a boy about here that i can get to take a package out to the brooks farm there's not a boy about sir to-night but myself and i'm on duty that's bad said the gentleman i haven't time to drive there i'm due at home this moment and he looked at his watch then his eye fell upon ben and rufus here are boys he said which of you two wants to earn a dollar i'll pay that to the one who will carry this small package to the brooks farm for me at once ben looked at rufus but rufus shook his head i'm not your boy he said promptly the brooks farm's as good as two miles from here and i've tramped all day and am tired besides i should miss the train and have to foot it home three miles more i'll go sir said ben speaking briskly as soon as he discovered that rufus did not want the job why ben said caroline in a low voice can you of course i can i'd walk more than five miles to-night to earn a dollar it is a good cool moonlight evening and i'd as lives take the tramp as not i'm not so very tired then you are my man said mr staunton heartily you are the widow bryant's boy are you not i thought so i can trust you the package is rather valuable now said ben when the carriage rolled away i'll leave line in your care rufus see that you get her home all right old fellow it's a wonder you will trust me said rufus half sulkily if you have heard of the dog in the manger you will understand rufus's state of mind he did not want to take the trouble to earn the dollar himself and at the same time he did not want ben to have it just his luck he could not help muttering as he turned away to pick up the lunch basket if there is any money errand he is sure to get it and if there is a fellow in the world who needs money it is i he was so used to that kind of muttering that positively his own folly did not occur to him ben laughed good-naturedly you can't do anything very dangerous to line i guess you see i trust her where i won't you or myself either now i'm off you are sure that is the car are you wouldn't you better ask before you take seats in it no i wouldn't said rufus of course it is the car didn't i come up in it last week from that same brook farm and i wish you joy of your journey there it is the roughest road a fellow ever walked you'll earn your dollar i can tell you all right said ben i want to earn it of course all the same i call it capital pay for taking a walk on a pleasant evening i wish you were right side up line and mother knew it you'd like no better fun than to go with me it would be pretty nice said line vainly trying to smile but feeling that her head ached so that it was hard to answer you are used up said ben pausing long enough to give her an anxious look i don't believe mother will approve of pleasure excursions when she hears daisy's story and sees you i shall be all right as soon as i get to bed said caroline bravely it is only a headache you know on account of the fright what a set of grannies rufus said in confidence to his sister i don't believe there was the least mite of danger if daisy hadn't been a little goose she would have scrambled out of there in no time oh no rufus cadwin said fanny you needn't say that you know you were scared about her yourself your face looked white when you saw where she was 
pooh said rufus you go to making a fuss about nothing now i never did see such a set and for fully five minutes after they had taken their seats in the car silence reigned caroline at once laid her aching head upon the seat and was glad to be still and fanny considered herself ill-treated and was silent while rufus nursed his ill-humor only however until a new thought struck him i say fanny he began forgetting his vexation in the new idea this would be a good time to go over to auntie brockway's and get some of those apples she promised us we couldn't walk over there said fanny doubtfully i should like to know why we couldn't don't you go to being a molly coddle said this consistent young gentleman forgetting entirely that he was a few minutes ago too tired to take an extra step it is not a bit over a quarter of a mile from the switch we could just have time to get there and back it would be ever so much less stupid than staying here doing nothing but we couldn't leave caroline well i should think she could sit still on the seat until we get back or lie still who do you suppose would come in and try to carry her off fanny looked over at her thoughtfully i believe she is asleep she said i thought line was stronger than that but rufus ben put her in our care no he didn't he said he would trust her where he wouldn't me he thinks he knows everything and she knows the rest fanny kedwin i'm going for apples are you coming or not maybe we will miss the train his sister said still hesitating maybe the moon is made of green cheese rufus said indignantly can you think of anything else to hinder us once for all i say i'm going you can come or not just as you please saying which he began to dispose of the few dishes and napkins left in the lunch basket by making a package of them to put in caroline's seat fanny turned to line say line we are going to run over to auntie brockaway's we'll be back in a few minutes caroline made no reply and her regular breathing told plainly that if she heard them at all she wove their words in as part of her dream she's asleep said rufus and will stay so till we get back come on we don't have more than time to get there and back he seized the empty basket and started dumping the bundle he had made at caroline's side as he passed fanny gave a lingering look at the sleeping girl and followed her brother out of the car i hope she won't wake up while we are gone she said she will be scared to find herself alone not she said rufus taking long strides down the road in the direction of auntie brockaway's she isn't one of the scared kind except where daisy is concerned they do make such a little baby of her it does put me out of all patience but i'll risk line waking up before we get back she looked as though she had started out for an all-night job End of chapter 4「Five of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. What Could Happen? An hour afterwards, the shrill whistle of the freight and accommodation quickened the footsteps of the two on their return trip. Both were loaded with apples, as many as they could carry, and it was not easy to hasten. Hurry up, said Rufus looking back with a frown at fanny's lingering footsteps we shall miss the train the next thing and have to foot it don't you hear the whistle i'm hurrying as fast as i can said fanny i'm just as tired as i can be you ought not to have dragged me off rufus kedwin and you'll find mother will think so too the simple truth is both those young people were not only tired but cross at the next minute they reached the train and fairly scrambled in with apples tumbling from them in every direction stupid muttered rufus still with a frown as he saw a large one roll from fanny's grasp you'd better say that to yourself retorted fanny i'm sure you dropped two 
with most unamiable speed they made their way along the narrow aisled tobacco-stained floor and bumped into a hard seat it took fanny a little time to recover from the first feeling of utter weariness with which she had thrown herself down as the car bumped and rattled itself over the road toward home she roused herself and began to look about for caroline the result was that rufus who had spread himself out in a seat in front of her his hat drawn over his eyes and his hands stuffed in his pockets felt himself not gently nudged and a shrill voice called into his ear where's line how should i know he said angrily where we left her i suppose curled up in a heap i wish you wouldn't yell into my ear fanny cadwin i must do rufus justice and tell you that he was not always in such ill humour as on this particular day the truth was certain matters troubled his conscience and gave an undertone of unhappiness to all his thoughts she isn't either was fanny's apparently irrelevant reply to his last remark i've looked at every seat in this car that's a likely story said rufus there isn't another passenger car on this train i can't help it if there isn't you can see for yourself that she is not here say rufus i'm afraid she woke up and was scared to find herself alone and got out and walked home because where would she be pooh said rufus nevertheless he roused himself and staggered through the car which was not an easy thing to do for the train was running even more irregularly than heavily laden freight trains usually do she isn't here he said when he at last succeeded in getting back to his seat i suppose she decided to walk home she took the bundle i laid in her seat what a goose we will get home long before she can and it is pretty dark too oh dear said fanny uneasily i'm afraid ben will blame us and his mother too fanny kedwin you may have observed paid very little attention to the construction of her sentences so that she understood what she meant herself she seemed to consider it of no consequence how puzzling her remarks might be to other people but rufus was used to her let him blame he said savagely i should like to know what we have to do with it if line bryant chooses to walk home she will do it in spite of anything you or i could do and as for being scared into it i tell you she is not one of that sort what was there to scare anybody i should like to know all there was to do was to sit still till the car got ready to start but it's so dark fanny murmured trying to rub a clean place in her window and flattening her nose against it i can't see anything hardly she said appealing to rufus after a minute don't look out then said rufus crossly there's nothing to see by daylight worth looking at and he curled himself down in his seat and drew his hat once more over his eyes by no means so composed inwardly as he was trying to pretend that caroline bryant had awakened and weary of waiting had started for home on foot was altogether probable and was a thing her mother would not like i could not have helped it if i had been here muttered rufus she would do what she liked in spite of me but then i suppose i could have tramped along with her and not have got mrs bryant down on me for some reason he did not clearly comprehend why rufus kedwin always felt that he would rather have almost any other person down on him than mrs bryant it was quite dark when the train reached the willow lane station which meant home to rufus and fanny and they made all speed out of the car and down the street toward their mother's house aren't you going to run over to mrs bryant's fanny asked as nearly breathless in trying to keep up with her brother's rapid steps she finally halted at her own door what for i should like to know why to see if line is all right no i am not miss kedwin if you want any more running tonight you may do it yourself i'm ready to go to bed why wouldn't line be all right you talk as though she were daisy or as though it was a hundred miles from the switch to her house 
it was reassuring to think that rufus had no fears of anything being wrong fanny contented herself with this and entered the house mrs kedwin was busy as usual she had just been attending to the supper of the latest comers and was already planning anxiously what she should have for their breakfast there was very little time to bestow upon her children how late you are she said mr holden stopped to tell me how you missed the train smart people you are to let the train go off and leave you well you had a splendid time i suppose and are as hungry as bears i thought so go to the kitchen and help yourselves susan kept something hot for you i should have been dreadfully worried if it hadn't been for mr holden it was real thoughtful in him to stop i think and then mrs kedwin dismissed them from her mind entirely it was perhaps an hour afterwards just as rufus was preparing to jump into bed that he heard voices in the hall one of which he thought he recognized and opened his door to listen it was certainly mrs bryant's voice his mother was saying in answer to some question apparently why they are in bed i guess yes i'm sure they are fanny went through the room while i was giving susan directions about breakfast and said she was going right to bed she was dreadful tired oh yes they came on the train why didn't ben and caroline come with them you don't say that's very queer i'll call them right away and the stair door opened fanny rufus where are you are you both in bed rufus where are line and ben bryant how should we know answered rufus getting into some clothes and appearing presently in the hall why didn't they come on the train and why don't you come along and tell all you know about them here's their mother most distracted they have neither of them come home with a good deal of cross-questioning rufus's story was drawn from him ben was easily accounted for there had not been time for him to go to the brook farm and return and then walk home but where could caroline be i supposed of course she was home said rufus now frightened out of his ill humor where else could she be we left her seated in the car all right and when we got back she was gone fanny and i thought of course she had walked home mrs bryant clasped her hands in speechless agony where could her daughter be what steps could she take to find out it seemed to her that she could not wait another minute she must know at once visions of her cherished darling making her way through the dark alone followed by ruffs her tired feet stumbling in the track just as a train rushed by visions of everything that could by any possibility surge through a mother's brain in a moment of time beset her rufus came slowly down the stairs his face the image of self-reproachful dismay but no one stopped to look at his face i might take a lantern and go along the road and look for her only and then he stopped it would have been awful to add the thought only if she is to be found along the track she must be dead or she could certainly have made her way home in truth the situation was perfectly unaccountable to him some of the men boarders will soon be in said mrs kedwin shall i get them out to hunt for her along the track she might have fallen you know and sprained her ankle or something that's so said rufus brightening and from that moment he rested his hopes upon a sprained ankle yes said mrs bryant eagerly or no let me think what to do and she leaned against the door and put both hands to her face to try to steady her heart sufficiently to plan suddenly on the quiet air broke the sound of a cheerful whistle rufus sprang forward that's ben's whistle he said he's made good time anyhow and he threw open the front door mrs bryant also recognized the notes and stepped out upon the piazza somehow it did not seem as though anything so terrible could have happened to caroline since her brother was whistling the cheerful music stopped however the moment ben caught sight of his mother's face mother he said huskily what is the matter 
daisy but he was interrupted my son where is caroline caroline he repeated dazed for a moment isn't she at home then he turned fiercely toward rufus where is line he asked oh ben i don't know said rufus mournfully all his petty ill-humor gone under the power of this terrible trouble i would give the world if i did i did not think anything could happen to her you know and he told his story eagerly with a painful sense of the fact that it told nothing at all in regard to the girl's whereabouts ben stood for a moment as one transfixed yet thinking swiftly all the time if he had taken time to look at his mother's face just then he might almost have had a thrill of joy over the keen hopeful gaze she bent upon him young as he was mrs bryant was learning to lean upon her son ben would surely do something mother he said suddenly let us go to mr holden he will know the quickest and best way of doing everything mrs bryant caught at the suggestion yes she said he will know i wonder i had not thought of him go at once ben and have men take lanterns and go down the track yes said ben i will go everywhere she must have tried to walk home and probably sat down to rest and fell asleep or fainted she was very tired and her head ached i'll bring you word of her soon mother will you go home i must said mrs bryant clasping her hands with a convulsive effort to control herself daisy is alone i came out to get some one to go for the doctor she is hoarse and i have left her for a long time i'll go right over there and stay with your mother said mrs kedwin to ben don't you worry about her and rufus shall run for the doctor this minute which rufus was glad to do not a reproachful word had been spoken to him but he did not like the look of ben's eyes when he asked for his sister he did not want to look at mrs bryant at all there was a sense in which he was to blame for this state of things mr holden was not at his boarding-house and no one knew where to look for him a little time was consumed in this way but not much ben almost ran over the gentleman as he was speeding down main street hurrah said mr holden cheerily is this an express train running away but the next moment he was the alert sympathizing friend we must find a railroad man he said quickly one who knows about trains she may have taken the wrong one and your mother is right we must send a party at once down the track toward the switch come with me to the young men's rooms there are a dozen men still there upon whom i can depend rapid work was done after this ben keeping close to mr holden who having started an eager and trustworthy company of young men down the track went himself to the station we will get what information we can here he said then we will take my horse and drive with all speed to the switch i have sent billy to harness her the station looked deserted the last night train was in not another until four o'clock the ticket office was closed and the night watchman knew nothing about trains or roads nothing to be learned here said mr holden we might go to the station agent but perhaps the quickest way will be to drive at once to the junction the night switch man there will surely know about his own switch what a ride it was through the moonlight ben had never taken such a ride before in his life he had often longed to do so he could not have counted the number of times he had said to line what a thing it would be to be skimming over the road on such a night as this nearly always such thoughts came to him when the moon was at its full at last he was having the experience but how far from happy he was mr holden talked cheerfully getting up theory after theory more to comfort ben than because he really was able to plan a theory to suit himself but ben scarcely heard him he was busy going over and over in his mind the wearying question where can line be what could have happened to her 
and then shivering over certain possibilities which would come crowding to the front here we are said mr holden at last sweeping around the curve and halting his horse before the faithful fellow had fairly stopped ben was on the ground and knocking violently at the little cabin or shed which was the night watchman's stopping place alas for their hopes he knew almost as little as the switchman in town number twenty five freight switched there and number twenty four took on a sort of passenger car it had done so that day he supposed he did not know anything about it but of course it did the car was not sidetracked now so of course it had gone he was not on duty at that point during the day the man who was had gone home sick his place was to be filled by a new hand he went up on the freight that night went to philadelphia his folks lived there some of them no he did not know who got on or off the freight he had not come on duty till eight o'clock that was after the freight had gone well said mr holden after questioning and cross-questioning the sleepy man until he could think of nothing more to ask we must find someone who knows more about trains than this man isn't it possible to find a person who might have been here when the six o'clock freight stood here and who can tell what happened the man was sure he did not know the division superintendent had been down to the switch that day and had spent some time looking about and talking to the switchman but he knew nothing about it himself only what somebody told him the man might have been there when the side-tracked car was put on he did not know who is that man and where is he asked mr holden he was a mr stevens who lived in lackawanna but he went into town for the night when he was down that way and stopped at the pelton house the man guessed but was not sure then we'll go to the pelton house said mr holden there must be somebody in the world who knows something of course the switch man who had been aroused had to have explained to him what was the matter and ben who listened felt the cold chills creep over his body it seemed so terrible when put into plain brief english that his sister caroline was missing the last that had been seen of her was at six o'clock when she took a seat in the side-tracked car and when the car started she was not to be found End of chapter 5chapter six of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six a new friend that's bad said the man gravely it's a kind of pokey place for a young girl i shouldn't have thought her folks would have let her stay there alone ben groaned and moved away but not what the switch man here is a decent enough fellow the man added and he would have looked after her if he had known she was in trouble but it kind of looks as if some one must have enticed her off now don't it some one came along with a horse and wagon maybe and offered to take her home ben fairly ground his teeth together to keep from screaming over the horrible suggestion but mr holden who had thought of that before only turned his head to see if the poor brother was within hearing then slipping something into the switch man's hand in return for his broken nap went back to his carriage saying we will find the division superintendent if he is to be found keep up courage ben my boy caroline is quietly sleeping somewhere i trust and god is over all you know caroline bryant having had her nap out tried to turn over but could not and wondered much why the bed seemed so narrow and hard and what sort of a storm could be abroad to shake it so then after an unusually hard jolt came to a sitting posture rubbed her eyes and tried to take in the situation where was she and what was the matter gradually memory recalled the last she knew about herself she had gone nutting and had almost drowned daisy and had a dreadful headache and ben went on an errand and she went on the cars to be hitched to the six o'clock freight where were rufus and fanny she looked about for them 
they were nowhere to be seen but a bundle looking as though it had been made up from the lunch baskets lay beside her she rubbed her eyes again and tried to straighten her much bent hat and wondered what made everything look so strange well said the conductor stopping before her seat have you had your nap out i've been waiting for your ticket some time but you were so sound asleep i hated to wake you ticket repeated caroline more dazed than before i haven't any ticket i was to pay on the cars or ben was oh i forgot ben was to go on an errand and i haven't any money but i can get it of rufus it is ten cents isn't it what is all this about asked the conductor and his voice began to grow stern he thought this young woman was trying to cheat him out of a fare caroline was growing wider awake and realized that she must have been talking in a most bewildering manner to a stranger what did he know about ben and rufus i beg your pardon she said her face growing red i think i was not quite awake but my brother and i got on at the switch i am only going into town i live there my brother had the money to pay for our fare but he was sent on an errand at the last moment and forgot to give it to me i shall have to borrow of a boy who is my friend if i can find him she looked anxiously down the car again murmuring where can rufus and fanny be the conductor eyed her keenly do you know what time it is he asked at last and his tone was a little kinder time said caroline turning back to him with a startled air why i suppose it is nearly seven o'clock this train gets into the station at seven you are mixed said the conductor kindly sitting down in a vacant seat in front of her you have been riding all night it is just getting morning look out of the window and you will see the red streak which the sun is making before it begins its day's work caroline bryant could never be paler than she was at that moment morning she said or rather gasped then where am i and what will mother do mother will have to be told all about it and she will be all right this time the conductor's voice was kindness itself you took the wrong train no doubt i can see how it was you thought you got into the car that was on the side track didn't you and that the night freight was bound to pick you up instead of being on that car you are on one that was sidetracked last night for the eastbound train to take we don't often do it but there was some upsetting of regular trains yesterday and we did it last night and now you are just getting into philadelphia poor caroline's utter dismay held her silent she struggled with the tears that would keep pushing into her eyes she struggled with the lump in her throat which was threatening to choke her what should she do what could she do a hundred miles from home and mother without money with nothing to eat her dress soiled and torn and no baggage but a towel much soiled with tart juice and two or three little plates which had held the tarts but more than all and worse oh a great deal worse what a night it must have been to mother and ben and little daisy what could they think had become of her how could mother endure the suspense of having her away and being unable to find out where she was never you mind said the conductor cheerily you are not in the worst place in the world by a great deal i live in philadelphia and i will see that you are taken care of and started back all right and will let your mother know as soon as we get in that you are safe and sound then when you get home think how glad they will all be to see you by this time the lady just in front of them had become interested and turned to the conductor mr brinker she said what is the matter did she take the wrong train she evidently did ma'am took a side-tracked car bound east instead of west and lay down and went to sleep and didn't wake up till morning i've wondered all night where she was going and how she came to be travelling alone and not put under any one's care but i didn't disturb her poor thing said the lady if she has friends they must be half wild about her 
and she too began to question caroline who was having a terrible battle with her tears and the lump in her throat a kind pleasant-faced woman she was after a moment caroline felt it to be a relief to answer her questions and make plain to her how easy it had been to make the mistake oh well said the lady don't worry about it the conductor will telegraph your mother as soon as we get in and assure her of your safety then he will send you back on the first train and you will have had a journey all by yourself and seen the world and will have a great deal to tell them all but i haven't money to pay for a ticket back said caroline timidly and the conductor who had been attending to other passengers while the lady talked but who now returned to caroline answered her heartily never mind that you don't need any ticket we ran away with you against your wish and intention and the best we can do is to run back with you it won't cost you a cent oh i thank you very much said caroline more relieved than he could imagine for even supposing that they would trust her for the money until she reached home of course she could not help wondering how mother could spare so much from the very small sum in her pocket-book the next question was when could she expect to reach home it seemed to her that she must fly there at once when can i get there she asked and all the longing in her heart shone in her eyes she can be put on the ten o'clock train can she not mr brinker asked the lady for the conductor had turned to answer another passenger and caroline was waiting there is no ten o'clock train mrs smith she will have to wait till tomorrow morning oh she could take the midnight train but i shouldn't advise it it has a long wait at the junction and gets into her place only three hours earlier than the ten o'clock with a night ride in the bargain tomorrow at ten o'clock if caroline had been told she must wait until she was twenty it is doubtful if it could have seemed a longer time to her than that did you say there was no train to-day she faltered no real passenger train after the one which will start before we get in not to-day you know it is sunday and the schedule on this road is not full on sunday we don't run trains for passengers sunday she had not thought of it before sunday morning and she a hundred miles from home was anything ever more terrible it's a pity it's sunday for your sake said the conductor but you turk up as well as you can the time will pass before you know it it will be monday morning in a little while and then for home i'll take her right along home with me ma'am he said addressing the lady my wife will make her comfortable and the children will be company for her that is very kind the lady said heartily i was thinking i would like to have her with me but our house is still closed you know and i shall go to a hotel as i am here only for sunday i expected to get in last night but our train was delayed at millville and i lost my connections you will be nicely taken care of she added to caroline as the conductor went his way he is a nice man and his wife is a good woman i have heard they have several nice children and it will be pleasant for you to go where there are children will it not besides the conductor will know all about the trains indeed i suppose you can go home on his train and he will take care of you caroline tried to think of some suitable thing to answer to all these kind suggestions but her heart was still full of dismay over the thought that she was a hundred miles from home and could not even start back for a whole day it was hard to think of anything else she murmured something about people being very kind and then the train gave that long drawn-out screech of satisfaction with which it enters a city station and the few passengers began to gather bundles and wraps together and prepare to leave the car mr brinker said the lady as the conductor hurried toward them i will seat her in the waiting-room near the north door thank you he said by the way my girl what is your mother's name bryant said caroline tremblingly 
it seemed so strange to be standing on the platform of a car telling her mother's name mrs bryant all right he said and was off again there seemed to be a great crowd of people around the depot sunday though it was there was more noise and pushing and confusion than she had ever seen before mrs smith nodded to a colored man who touched his hat at sight of her good morning james i'm here at last almost came last night did mr smith wait up all night for me i want to go into the station a moment and then we'll be ready caroline followed her like one in a dream the lady seemed not to mind the crowd nor the noise and to be perfectly at home among the sights and sounds so strange to this new traveller left in a quiet corner of the large room which looked to her like a world in itself poor caroline was distressed to find that she could not keep the tears from gathering in her eyes wipe them away as fast as she could there was still another ready as soon as the last one had been disposed of she made no noise with her weeping and could have given almost anything to have been able to keep the tears from appearing the more especially as she saw she was attracting the attention of two or three loungers who seemed to have nothing in particular to do except to put their hands into their pockets and stare it was all hard to bear suppose that busy conductor who after all was a stranger to her should forget about her and go home what in the world would she do then she did not even remember his name much less where he lived she did not know where anybody lived she was alone in a great city and it was just getting daylight on sunday morning and what oh what did her mother think it seemed to the poor girl that she must fly just then the constantly swinging door opened and the face of her one acquaintance appeared once more he looked about with a swift keen glance caroline arose at once he spied her here we are he said striding toward her all ready for home and breakfast and a wink of sleep i shall want i think you did that up pretty well last night i wired your mother that you were all right and had the message repeated to make sure that it was understood and told them that you would be on hand tomorrow without fail and sent a special messenger up to your house with it before we get home she will be reading all about you caroline was grateful and puzzled though familiar with the word telegraph she had never heard of anything being wired then how could a man in philadelphia direct a special messenger a hundred miles away to carry a message i suppose he wired that too thought caroline wondering if ben would have understood all about it but then ben had never travelled she ought certainly by this time to know more than he they went out into the whirl of people again for though it was in reality quiet on broad street to caroline it seemed as if there were at least a county fair in progress the conductor took long steps and dodged around corners and crossed streets in a bewildering way she had as much as she could do to keep up to him yet the sights she saw filled her with amazement do the people in philadelphia go right on she said without paying any attention to sunday bless you no they pay a great deal of attention to sunday in this city more than they do in most cities of its size i guess things are pretty quiet to-day but you see there are so many people in the world that they make something of a stir in spite of themselves some of these people are just getting home from night work in different parts of the city but then it is very quiet you just take a look at it tomorrow when we come down for the train and you'll see a difference just then he lifted his hand in a peculiar manner and a man who was driving what was to caroline the strangest looking wagon she had ever seen drew up his horses and the wagon came to a standstill it had a number of little wheels smaller than caroline supposed wagon wheels were ever made we'll get into this car he said and that will save us a long walk and leave us a long enough one at the other end i often wish i lived nearer the depot 
but then it wouldn't be so nice for my children as where I am now. Caroline was busy with one word, car, but there was no engine, only two horses. It must be a street car. She had heard Miss Webster speak of them, and also Judge Dunmore, and here she was getting into one. Street cars, then, did not stop for Sundays. She almost wished that steam cars did not, just for that once, she told herself pitifully, without having an idea that there were plenty of steam cars which had not a thought of stopping for Sunday. She began to wonder how they managed the street car business so the drivers could go to church. Flesh and blood horses are handy things when you can't get iron ones, her friend said, settling his burly form into a seat beside her. Then Caroline ventured to ask a question. Since she was here in a large city, and must stay till tomorrow, why not make the best of it and learn all she could? Is this what they call a street car, sir? Yes, street cars or horse cars, whichever you want to. Didn't you ever ride in one before? I want to know. It must be kind of nice to have something new happen. I've rattled around in them so long, I'd forgotten that they were not everywhere. Do they run all day Sunday? Oh, bless you, yes, and half the night. Every five minutes in the day they rack it by this corner. Down on some of the corners they come oftener. Where are all the people going? asked Caroline, amazed. Couldn't they stay at home on Sunday? Oh, to different places, some to church, some to Sunday school, and those sort of places, and some go a pleasuring to the woods in nice weather like this, and to the parks to see their friends. Oh, there's places enough. Many go down to the ferry and take a boat ride. But how do the men manage to go to church if they are kept so busy all day? What men? and Mr. Brinker turned his keen, half-amused, wholly interested eyes upon his new acquaintance. Why, the driver? That man who sits out on the stool and manages the horses? Oh, well, I don't believe he manages that matter at all. And the broad shoulders of the conductor were shaken a little, as though he might be laughing inside. They don't go to church once a year, I suppose. But is that right? asked Caroline, in a tone so grieved that the laugh of her companion died out. "'It doesn't look so, does it?' he said. "'It's a dog's life they live, and that's a fact. At it early and late, Sunday and Monday and every day. They don't get half a chance to eat or sleep, let alone going to church. No, I always thought the horse-car men had it harder than the steam-car men on most roads, and that is unnecessary. Ours is hard enough.' I should think everybody ought to have a chance to go to church, said Caroline gravely. Well, I don't know as to that. The half nor the quarter would not go if they had a chance. They aren't of that kind. They'd rather loaf around the saloons than go to any church that was ever heard of, and I suppose they might better be driving horses than doing that. If they were fond of going to church, why, it might be different. I don't think that makes any difference, said Caroline, with a grave shake of the head. You don't? Why not? You can't oblige them to go to church. It's a free country. No, but you can give them a chance, so that if they don't go, it will be their fault and not yours. The conductor gave his companion a thoughtful look. That's a pretty true notion of yours, I guess he said, after a moment's silence. Give them a chance, and if they choose the wrong side of the road when you've made a clear path to the right, why, you wash your hands of it, eh? That's a cute remark for one of your years who has never been in a city before. End of chapter 6